Welcome to the Inspire Podcast, where we interview inspiring people from around the globe who are uplifting their community by finding solutions to our world's problems. My name is M. Barrett, and I am your host. And I hope that you'll get as inspired as I am by meeting these everyday people doing extraordinary things. Matthew Burroughs is a contemporary British painter who started an unbelievable social media movement. You might not have heard of it, or maybe you have. But he's the founder of Artist Support Pledge, an initiative that provided new financial income for thousands of artists and makers during the pandemic. Artists were particularly hit hard by the pandemic, with many of their usual routes for sales being closed down. The idea is simple. Artists post images of their work for sale on Instagram with the hashtag Artist Support Pledge. Each work is an original piece that doesn't cost more than 200 pounds. The cool thing is, that for every 1,000 pounds of sales an artist makes, they pledge to reinvest 200 pounds in the scheme, supporting a continuing flow of sales. Anyone can take part in either selling or buying, and the inclusive nature of Artist Support Pledge has created a generous culture and a new egalitarian microeconomy that is estimated today to have generated over 80 million pounds. It is a global movement bringing communities together through the power of art, providing artists and craft makers with a way to share their work on social media and sustain one another. It has also created a market for many artists who had previously never sold their work. Talking to Matthew was truly inspiring. He is so aware of how when we come together and build community together, we all get to thrive. By creating this simple yet very effective solution to support artists globally, he essentially changed the market for art through a model of generosity and gift economy. I am amazed and moved by the power of his work, and it has definitely given me a big dose of faith back in humanity. This is my conversation with Matthew Burrows. Thank you so much for coming on and taking the time to speak with me. I just also wanted to ask you how you're doing today. Um, good. I've uh, spent the day painting, so that's always a good sign. Yeah, I bet. I actually had a really cheeky question to ask you because I know you're an artist and a painter. And I think that um, <laughs> this might be a bit mean to ask, but do you have a favorite color? You know, I've, I, lots of people ask me this, but no is the answer. I don't. I mean, I have a, I have colors that I use maybe for, you know, that, a kind of preference for a, a few days or a few weeks even. But that's not because they're my favorite colors. It's just because they lend themselves to the work that I'm making. And as, as soon as I, you know, I'm making something else, then the color changes. I suppose I have a, a, a kind of an approach to color, which is less about having a favorite color, and much more about how I create colors. But that's, that's a much more complex answer to, to come up with. All right. Well, that's great. And where, where, are you, where are you right now? Where are you based? I'm actually sitting in my studio at the moment, and my studio is in East Sussex. Uh, so it's about sort of 50 miles or so outside of London on the southeast coast uh, of the UK. That's, that's really nice. Well, I asked you to come on to talk to you about Artist Support Pledge and the work that you've done about this uh, non-profit organization that you've launched back in 2020. I've been following the work that you've been doing since the beginning. I learned about it back when I was in lockdown, actually. And I thought it was so, so great. I've been a, kind of like a big fan, and I feel it's a real privilege to talk to you in person now. So I wanted to ask you, how did it all start? And uh, if you could tell me a little bit about where did that idea come from? How did it begin? Yeah, well, it started on the sort of 16th of March 2020, when in, in the UK, we were going into a kind of a heavy lockdown. And at that point, I'd been sitting kind of at my computer answering emails and all of the projects and exhibitions that I'd had planned for the next year or two had come to an end. They'd all been cancelled literally within an hour. And at the same time that was happening, I was seeing messages from friends on social media saying exactly the same thing. And it just felt like this wave of desperation hit artists across the world in a way that I'd never experienced before. And I don't think probably has been experienced in, in this country certainly not on a global level uh, in many lifetimes. And I knew at that point that, that there wasn't going to be a sort of obvious support mechanism because there weren't really any, any precedent for this. Nobody really knew what to do. Those people and those organizations that might otherwise be 
charged with supporting artists couldn't deal with something on this scale. So I just sort of thought, well, something's got to be done, even if it's a small thing. And I, I wrote on my, a piece of paper by my computer, asset. What are my assets? What have I got that can help? And I came up with two immediately. One was that I had artwork. I'd had this idea about a, a culture and a community, a network of trust and generosity, which I've been working with for probably about 15 years amongst friends and peers. And it's my belief that if you create a network and community of artists that are bound by a sense of trust and generosity to one another, everything's easier to do. So whether that's critical thinking, talking about your work, whether it's developing your career, whether it's supporting yourself creatively, emotionally, your well-being, your finances, everything. And so I, I kind of knew I had this network of people out there who I could help put this into action. And I had this idea of how to do it. So then really it was about coming up with what Art of Book Pledge actually is, which is this very simple formula for how to sell work and how to support other artists. And for those people who, who don't know it, basically artists can post images of their work for sale on social media, and we usually use Instagram, for £200 or less. And every time they reach £1,000 worth of sales, they pledge to buy another artist's work for £200. So it has a sort of virtuous cycle within it. And because it's a low threshold in terms of how much you can charge for the work, it meant that it's, it created an immediate economy. And, and when it went live on the 16th of March, when I, I posted the first post on my Instagram account that evening about 8 p.m. And by the following lunchtime, I was, had made my first pledge and I was buying somebody else's work. So I realized really quickly that it, it was much quicker than I expected when I made the first post. That perhaps it might generate a bit of money for my friends and colleagues. And that was it, really. But within a few days, it had gone global. Wow. In a few days, it went global. Yeah, I think by the end of the first week, we were in, we were in every continent other than Antarctica. Wow. Do you have any idea how the word spread so fast or it just happened? I think there was an, I think there was a, it was the perfect storm really. I think my timing was really good. I came up with the right idea at the right time. I mean I I describe it now as if there was a sudden vacuum created where everything stopped. Everyone went home and there was a moment of complete silence and pause. And I just threw something in at that point and there wasn't anything else to do. And it was a simple idea everyone could do it. And I think people were desperate enough just to give anything a go. Uh, and also, on top of that, everyone suddenly went onto social media because they couldn't go out and they couldn't um, socialize. So the only way they could communicate one another was through social media. So all of those things together created this perfect set of relationships that made it just explode. That's so wild. That's so cool. And when you made that first post and realized this can happen. What were you at the time hoping to achieve with this? Were you thinking of that or, or was it just, like you said, you were just giving the idea a go? Really, my, my biggest ambition was that if I could for a few weeks help support some people I knew, you know, friends of mine, artists who I'd seen messages coming through from on, on the social media, and I thought, oh my God, they're in a really difficult situation. Perhaps I can help support them. And by complete coincidence, I'd actually had a number of editions of prints, of etchings, sent back to me from a publisher. And so I had all these in the studio, and that's, in effect, what gave me the idea. I thought, well, what am I going to do with them? Well, I could actually sell those to support my friends, and that was really what it was. Then it was, okay, how do I do that, and how do I make that into something that is ongoing so other people can do? I didn't really expect that many people would do it. So I thought maybe it would touch upon people I'm networked into in the southeast of England and in London mainly. Um, but clearly it, social media is, has global reach. And so once it gained momentum on that, it just kept going. Yeah, it does. I mean, I just checked on Instagram today, the hashtag, and it's close to 800,000 posts under your hashtag. And it's so incredible how it grew so 
so big and so fast. And is it just you that was involved in creating the concept or has it changed or has it grown since you launched back in 2020? Yeah, I mean, it was predominantly just myself for the first year or so. And quite quickly, I think maybe after the first week, I built a team of advisors um, because I was been challenged by problems that I'd never faced before. And I certainly wasn't an expert on social media. So I had to upskill myself very quickly. So I'd get consultants to spend an hour or two with me each day on Zoom to sort of tell me what to do and how to do it. But I also got people in the industry who I thought would, you know, well equipped to help me through the trials and tribulations of setting up a global movement without having any planning in place beforehand. Uh, and that worked really effectively and they were all fantastic. But on the day to day basis, it was just me literally sitting where I am now on a computer with my phone. Uh, and that went on for well over a year. I now have some help, certainly with the administration and collating data and stuff like that for uh, and information I need to kind of design the posts. The posts are still largely designed by myself on, on the social media accounts. And I'm still, I still do all the PR, so all of the interviews and press stuff, that's still all me. We're, we are in the process of developing a funding bid to turn it into a mainstream, fully funded organization, hopefully by September. And we've partnered up with a company called the Artist Information Company, who have a long track record of being an arts membership company in the UK. So they are helping us do that, which is invaluable. They've been really supportive and very helpful. Wow, that's great. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot more to it than just posting a picture of your art in a hashtag. Can you talk to me a little bit about the process behind the scenes? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I didn't know any of this before I started. I, I was a very basic user of social media and I, I used it and I knew how hashtags worked. And that was about it, basically. But I think once it sort of gained momentum, the thing that I kind of now realize is that when you put something like this out into the world, you know, a lot of hashtags they do disappear, they die out quite quickly. And they die out quickly because nobody maintains the culture of it and the ethos of it and, and, it's, and develops its PR. You need to be constantly doing that because otherwise it gets filtered away. I and mean, that's a constant challenge is to keep people aware of what it is, how it works, what the value system around how it operates is and why. So a lot of my time is spent developing innovations and collaborations with different organizations and individuals to try and keep that goodwill out in, in the world so that it's networked into the industry. So I'm constantly working with professionals within the art, critics, gallery directors, publishers, things like that, to do interactions with Art Support Pledge. So that keeps its name out there and keeps it vital amongst the professional art people. But also we're collaborating with different organizations. We did a um, month-long campaign with Artwise and the World Wildlife Federation. We've just finished a, a month-long campaign for Ukraine and developed the Ukraine Support Pledge to help support that, which is an ongoing enterprise, but we spent a month-long, you know, focused campaign on that. So, you know, it enables us to kind of do stuff as well, because now we have a platform where we have a lot of people looking at what we do. And the thing that's really critical about our support pledge is it's not just a sales platform. It's actually an idea about how we are a community and how we can thrive within that community. So it's changing a kind of linear economy that we're used to. In other words, it goes in one direction and the people at one end get rich and the people at the other end are poor to a much more egalitarian economy where it's within the interest of everyone within the community to make sure that the common good of that community is supported. So in a way, what it's trying to move towards is a more horizontal economy rather than a vertical economy. So if you're a successful person on our support pledge, if you're doing well on it and selling a lot of work, you're actually supporting more of the artists on it. So you're, you're actually spreading out your success across your community. And all the interventions we do on it, from things like in-view posts, the studio in-view posts, to the collaborations, to the XLX, they're all designed to spread that generosity across the network. And I don't know if you remember from the very beginning, but the strap line for our support pledge was generosity is infectious. And really what I was trying to do was replicate the COVID pandemic, but doing it through a set of human values that could support one another. So if we all act like this, 
we will survive. And I think what surprised so many people, including myself, was quite how effective that was. Yeah, it's so beautiful. And what I think is so interesting about it as well is that it came out of this particular situation with COVID and lockdown and everything being closed or canceled or shut and as um, like an emergency relief in that situation, but that it can survive after this because actually this is a model that we need, even if we're not in the middle of a pandemic. And it's really incredible and it's amazing to see it persist and continue even though galleries and museums and shops and things are, are open again. I wanted to ask you, like, this is an open-ended question because sometimes it's a little bit difficult to answer, but if there is one most important thing or things that needs to be known about what you're doing and Artist Support Pledge, what, what would it be? It's to tell people what it is. It's as simple as that. Is to one of, the, one of the problems is if people just use the hashtag, if you just use the hashtag, you're relying on somebody else to tell everyone else what it is. So it diminishes its capacity. If everyone who's on it puts on their posts and on their accounts what our support pledge is and how it works, it vastly increases the amount of people who have access to it. And the, the more people have access to it, the more people there are to support the people on it. And every time somebody doesn't do that, it not only diminishes the capacity of that, but you're relying on an ever smaller amount of people who are going to actually support you. So it's in everyone's interest to do that. And that's why I call it a generous culture. I mean, what most people in, in developed countries don't realize is that generous cultures existed for hundreds of thousands of years before industrial society. I mean, industrial society is up to about 10,000 years old. But it's nothing in the scheme of things. It's nothing in relationship to generous cultures that sustained human beings equally with gender equality and social equality in an environmentally sustainable way for hundreds of thousands of years before we had initially agrarian industrialization. But that sort of idea that somehow it's a quaint notion is not true. It's actually the most successful cultural idea in human history. It's just we've forgotten about it or we don't practice it anymore. And in a way, I was kind of aware of this and really liked the idea of generous egalitarian cultures. And so when I set up our support pledge, that's the model I used. I, I honestly didn't expect it would do that well, but it was clear in a way that, you know, it had traction quite quickly. And I think part of that is because of the way social media can connect us. So, you know, it goes from being just, as it would have been, you know, in history, small communities operating together to connected communities of friends who are then connected globally to one another. I mean, I guess that's the coolest thing about the fact that we have these ways to be able to connect throughout the globe, where that can actually grow and turn into global movements, whereas before, maybe not so much, but the idea is the same. And I really like what you're saying about how this is a type of economy that always existed. And that's definitely something that, you know, needs to be reintroduced because it seems like it can definitely work better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing, I don't know if you've ever heard of the term weird, obviously, I, you know, you know what the word means, but weird for psychologists stands for Western educated, industrialized, rich democracies. And people who live in those countries, which is most of us, and most of the people who use our support pledge have a subjective bias, have a bias about their values that they don't even realize they have. So a lot of the research that was done by psychologists on what made us human is done on people in those countries and in those situations. So it's, it, what happened was when the psychologists realized this, they realized that they were getting results from these surveys and these, these, this research that was telling them, them something about human nature that they thought was was true across time and across globally. And then what they realized was it wasn't true. And that when they researched communities outside of those weird countries, they got completely different value systems. And in a way, one of the challenges for our support pledge, because it's about human behavior and human values and how we communicate and reciprocate our relationships, you've got to overcome those subjective biases. You've got to convince people that they have them is the first thing because we don't know we have them you don't wear them on your sleeve and you don't necessarily know you're doing it 
But we're always, every day, everything we do, we're making decisions about what is right and wrong and what is good and bad. And they are based on those values. So it's, it's building a sense of self-awareness about how we act and also then replacing the values with the new ones that enable us to act in a way which is for the good of the community. And a sort of simple example of this is if I say the word success, what most people in weird countries think that means is that someone is either wealthy and or both famous. So this idea that you become unique and that you are celebrated for your specialness and your uniqueness and that the reward for that is that you are wealthier than everybody else and you have the right to that wealth is a particular value of rich industrial societies. If you go into generous cultures, they would think the opposite. They would think that it was a shame on the community if one person had all the wealth and they had that at the expense of the good of the community. And that not only that, but they were famous for it. And that was okay, is not seen as a good thing. So what I try to do is to get people to think about, okay, what does success mean in a generous culture? And I think for our support pledge, success must be when everyone in the community of our support pledge has access and opportunity to not only contribute, but to be creatively nourished, rewarded, both in their own sense of who they are in their well-being, but also financially. Because if we can't manage to do that for all of us, then we are really failing, all of us. You know, it's not my fault. You know, I'm doing my best in the sense it's not all down to me, it's down to us. And that's why a lot of the messaging is about we and us and together, and that if we share, we'll get these results. It's just that careful shift of saying, Success isn't my success, it is our success. Just a shift of words, and it totally changes what we can and should do. But that's a challenge, because a lot of artists still operate in the idea that somehow being a successful artist means being famous or, and, and having a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. That's actually so accurate and so beautiful what you're saying. I had never heard of the term weird and I definitely love that because it is a, a framework a really good framework to look at things through and I think about these things quite a lot but I've never heard that term so thank you so much for sharing that with me because I'm taking that back with me and using it again 100% and speaking of that it seems like you are achieving that through our support pledge and what has been the impact that you've seen of the organization since you started I mean, there's so many ways of looking at it because I read some articles that were saying that through this economy, 80 million pounds got raised. There's 800,000 posts on Instagram that uses the hashtag, but maybe you have a different version of impact. So I'd love to hear uh, your perspective. Yeah, for me, certainly the financial impact is huge. We don't know exactly how much it is. I have a guy who does the economic modeling for me who gives me a kind of upper amount a low amount, and then a kind of realistic bit in the middle, which is probably what it is. And the upper amount is staggering. I mean, it's it's nearly 300 million. So it's, you know, it isn't that. I guarantee it's not that. It is it is probably, I think, around sort of 80 million um, at the moment. And I'm very conservative in the way I estimate. It, it's, it could be actually quite a lot more than that. But I always like to take the lower figures <laughs> because I think I'd rather do that than than overblow it and get it wrong but in a way I think the thing that's been more important certainly to me in terms of my response to it is the anecdotal evidence it's the artists the supporters the collectors those who don't even participate as, as artists or buyers but are in a way engaged with the, with the community itself with this idea that there's a different way of living there's a different way of being community there's a different way of supporting one another and you know I, i've received thousands and thousands and thousands of messages from people from all over the world telling me how it's changed their lives sometimes it's simply that thank you for i've paid the rent this month you know and i've had quite a few messages from people who said they've bought houses obviously not paid outright for the house but they've through doing our support page, managed to raise a down payment on buying a house. Many people I've spoken to who have given up their day jobs that they had 
pre-COVID to work full time as artists because of our support pledge. So it really has completely changed the artistic landscape. And who would have imagined it? No one. Certainly I didn't. Yeah, well, I did, but I didn't imagine that's what it was going to achieve. That's really mind blowing. I'm just thinking about what you said at the very beginning, how you just posted one picture <laughs> and thought, oh, I'd give this a go and see if this works and that it actually changes the whole landscape for the art world. I really love the fact that also there's like a cap of 200 pounds for a piece of art. So it's accessible for anyone to buy who maybe people who are interested in art, who are interested in buying art, who want to support artists can actually afford things and, you know, contribute as well. I think that's, uh, that's just really, really smart, the whole concept on all the sides. And, and the impact is, is just incredible. And I wanted to ask you then also, because there's always challenges when you are starting something like this, what are the biggest challenges in, that you faced throughout these last two years and how have you dealt with them? I think I was in so many. I mean, on, on a practical level, the sheer workload, because we were in lockdown, I, of course, I had to work on my own and I set it up without planning. I hadn't planned what to do and how to do it. I didn't have the skills or expertise. I didn't have a team of people. So I did everything the wrong way around. You know, I had a successful enterprise without actually having anything to run it. So for the first few months I literally just worked non-stop seven days a week sometimes 18 20 hours a day I, I rarely got any sleep and that that was the biggest challenge because I, I can tell you that that's not pleasant <laughs> it wasn't very nice but I'm on more or less on top of it now capacity still an issue it's still a lot of work and partly because obviously I have my day job as well which is being an artist so I have to manage this do the work spend my day doing what I do and all the things I have to do around that and still, you know, carry on doing our support pledge and all the stuff that off the back of that that comes up. So there's an awful lot of extra stuff that comes up. So that is on a practical level is, is a day to day challenge. But I think I've got that fairly under control now. I guess another issue about that really is about capacity is I started it with no money. So, you know, I didn't have funding. I didn't have a mechanism for generating cash. So it was, you know, I had to pay for everything. So that was a a personal challenge because I had to find the money to pay for things. And then again, you know, with having people now helping, I had to find the money to pay them. So, you know, that, that was a sort of an unexpected shift in my life from working on my own to having support of the people. But then they're all things that you can overcome and with the right resources you can get sorted. I think, I guess there's also the motivation. I realized that because so much of this is, is born out of my own curiosity and, and interest in different cultural mechanisms. If I just carried on doing the same thing over and over again, I, I would just lose momentum. So one of the things that I've done over the two years now that I've been doing it is every now and again, I just invent something new. And that excites me for a couple of months. <laughs> that motivates me to kind of come up with new ideas and that keeps it going. I mean, in long term, these sorts of issues won't be so much of a problem because we'll have staff who are there to deal with it. But that's been quite interesting in a way. I quite like the idea of coming up with, with new inventive ways of thinking and approaching these values. And then I guess a lot of it's about dealing with people as well. Fundamentally, you're looking at human behavior. And on the whole, most people who, who do it successfully understand that why it matters and they do it. But with anything like this, with any kind of movement, the edges of it are very blurry. So there's a lot of people using it who don't really know what it is and don't really know how it works. And getting to them is the constant challenge, to inform them of what it is. Because some don't even know that there's a way of being informed by it. They don't even know that there's an Instagram account or there's a website. And it can take a while for people to find those. But I think that largely works. It's not perfect by any means. But I also think, is it working at a level that is acceptable? Well, clearly it is. So that'll have to do for now until we can uh, invent something that is more effective. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually completely fair enough because you can only do with what you've got and with the amount of time and energy and, and motivation and creativity that you have. So, And it is doing really great. And I saw the latest campaign that you ran because you were talking about every couple of months coming up with a new idea. 
just to push you forward. And I saw that you also set up the Ukraine support pledge. And I thought that was really, really cool and interesting. And I just wanted to know if you want to talk about that a little bit as well. Yeah, sure. I think one of the things that really matters to the way our support pledge works is that it's agile. It's quick. It can respond immediately because we're talking about human behavior and values and you can change them instantly by just saying so. And it's one of the reasons why our support pledge took off so quickly at the beginning. And when the Ukraine crisis started, it was clear to me that this was something that our support pledge could respond to. And not only that, but people were already doing it. So straight away, artists on our support pledge were donating money to Ukraine-based charities. So it seemed, okay, how can I make that work better? If we can, you know, it's always the same thing. You know, if we do something on our own, we can achieve X. If we do it together, we can achieve a million times X. So it's simply always, okay, how do I create a mechanism that takes the advantage of the mass and and sharpens that into something that's effective and the simple solution to that really was just to come up with a mechanism for people to make posting selling and then donating the money easy because one of the things that's always a barrier for a lot of people is if there's anything that makes it slightly tricky or if there's a technological barrier that might be difficult for people to overcome they won't do it so at every point, one of my mantras for our support pledge was light touch and effective. It had to be easy to do and it had to work. If it was neither of those things, it wasn't worth doing. And I still get, I get messages from people all over the world saying, I've got this great idea for helping somebody do this or that. And they tell me their idea. And nearly always, they're too complicated. And it's not necessarily a bad idea. But you would need a team of 20 to 100 people and lots of money to make it work. Whereas with our support pledge, in effect, it should be able to do something with just the available materials and resources and tools and just with a few people to manage it. If you can do that, then that's enough. And so Ukraine support pledge really was just a response to the crisis. And it's although we ran it as a month-long campaign, we're leaving it open and it's going to continue so people can keep posting work and selling it and donating the money. But the reason it was a month-long campaign is that any campaign, it's very hard to make a campaign last more than a month. A month's sort of the limit on how long you can actually gain people's attention and actually get them to respond. Just a little side note, Matthew Barrows asked me to pass on the message that he would like to thank the Artist Information Company and his collaborator on Ukraine Support Pledge, Xavier Ellis of the Ellis Smith Projects. And now back to the show. That's really great. Yeah, because I saw that and uh, I just thought it was a really, really great idea. And and uh, I saw also that, you know, artists are getting really involved in protesting and making commentary about what's going on. And I just thought that using your platform in order to help the situation. That was just really great. It was funny when I started it, I actually thought I was quite late getting it started. It turns out I was one of the first people to do it. <laughs> but I remember it, when it, Russia invaded Ukraine, I was uh, away doing a film with Facebook for our support pledge. Um, and I was super busy and I just didn't have the time to do anything, but it was on my mind and I was sitting on the train writing notes about it. And I, I got back one evening and I thought okay tomorrow I'll launch something for Ukraine it then took me actually a day or two to actually work out and do all the work to make it you know to put it out into the world I didn't want to make the same mistakes I made with our support pledge where I went in unprepared so I did a bit of preparation but I got it out I think within about four or five days of the invasion starting which was fairly quick and then actually a few days after that the press started getting involved and saying you know you seem to be the only person doing it and actually, I wasn't. There were there were other people in the arts who were actually in the process of doing it, but they just took a lot longer to get into the point of actually launching it. And I think it's not because their response wasn't immediate, simply that they were using much more complex mechanisms. And it's, again, it's the same thing because the way I do things is quick. It's simple. It's light touch. I can respond immediately. And if it wasn't for the fact that I'd been away, I probably could have got it out you know, within a day of the invasion. 
Yeah, and that's an incredible model because not only um, does it create, like you were saying, this horizontal economy, which I almost see as kind of circular because it keeps giving back, you know, it's almost like a ring. And it's on top of that, it's very easy uh, to apply and very quick. And so it's a very inspiring model and definitely should be replicated in many other areas, I think, because it works and it works well and it helps communities to grow and support each other. So that's incredible. And um, so you were saying also about how you were going to be a fully funded organization by September. That's really exciting and congratulations for that. And so what are the future plans for Art Support Pledge? What are you envisioning for the future? Yeah, there's a few things really. One is to keep going what we've already started. So I want to keep that sense that it is open, free access to all using the simplest means possible. That has its downsides as well. It's not perfect. So what one of the ways we're going to approach that is to have a number of mechanisms. So is to develop our own platforms so that not a competition to Instagram, because I can't do that, it's, it's too big, but to come up with uh, much more sophisticated websites and apps that can actually help support artists long term. And also to, as you may be aware, that we've, we've also launched our sort of hybrid versions where we are putting our support pledge exhibitions into museums. So we've just had, it, which ends next week, a four-month-long museum show at Hastings Contemporary in, in the UK, with uh, 307 artworks from artists around the world. And all the work in the exhibition is for sale by connecting the artist to their Instagram account. So rather than a label on the wall telling you who the artist is, you get the artist's Instagram account details. You can go straight to their Instagram account, buy the work that's on the wall, or buy another piece of work. So again, it's about using the tools that are available to help support the artists who are showing in the exhibition simply by connecting people. It's a very simple idea, but it works. And we're going to do this. We've got another one opening in May at uh, the New Art Gallery in Warsaw with 100 artists in that. And we had 50 artists selected. And then each of those 50 artists selected another artist from our support pledge. And then the plan is long term to do a generous space exhibition every year, a different venue across the country so that's i i tout it as the sort of an egalitarian turner prize turner prize is a big art prize in the uk with as many artists as we can get in it as possible so they're kind of two of the things that we're working on we're also looking at building collections because one of the things that's happened from this is that artists and supporters have built huge collections of art and what i don't want to see is that artists run out of motivation to buy art through it um, when they've sold work. So what I want to do is turn them into philanthropists. So those artists who have been successful on it, who have bought lots and lots of work, rather than just putting that work into drawers and cupboards because they haven't got enough wall space to put it, is for that work then to be donated to collections. And we donate those collections to caregiving institutions and communities like hospitals and things like that. I, I call them environments of generosity if we can increase that generous spirit by donating collections of works and the artists become the philanthropists. Wow. That's another full circle model that you're describing there. And that's so that's so awesome. Actually, I'm making a quick link with, um, you must know them, hospital rooms. Yeah. yeah, I've worked with hospital rooms right at the beginning of our support pledge, actually. Okay, that's so cool because that's what I was thinking about when you were talking about uh, donating art for for hospitals or for other caretaking environments or environments of generosity, as you beautifully said it, which I think is a very nice way of putting it. And yeah, that's that's a whole other topic in and of itself, but making those spaces, spaces where people can be in contact with art, that's very, very important. So that's really great. And so I want to ask you our question that we like to ask all of our guests, because it doesn't have to be about what you're doing, it could be very personal. I quite like it because every time it's a very surprising answer, but basically our motto at the Inspire is inspiring people, inspiring people. And we really consider every person that we talk to to be an inspiring person. And so we want to turn the question over to, to you and ask you who inspires you. Uh, Simone Wheel, 
who was a French philosopher, one of many uh, who inspired me, but although she was past the elite, intellectual elite of France, she, she gave in any pretenses for having a well-paid job and worked with uh, the working people in the factories to sort of see the reality of how, how their lives were. I think anyone who can break down those barriers between the hierarchies of power and the everyday, I think they're, they're the people who inspire me. Wow, that's a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> and she's really, really great, yeah. All right, well then, my very last question now is more about you and and just if you would like to share with our listeners where they can find you on the internet or elsewhere and also how they can support what you do. Yeah, well, you can find Artist Support Pledge on Instagram at Artist Support Pledge or on the website at www artistsupportpledge.com and you can find me at, um, at Matthew Burrow Studio on Instagram. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on and for talking with me and sharing so generously your story and what you're doing because I find that so inspiring and the word definitely needs to be spread even more even though it already has globally. <laughs> But um, I just think it's, yeah, it's really terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you, Em. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for listening to the Inspirer podcast. If you like this episode, please subscribe and review our show. It helps us grow our audience. And if you want to know more, check out the article on our website, theinspired.news. And let's stay in touch. Follow us on social media using the handle The Inspirer News. This podcast is hosted and produced by The Inspirer and the music was produced by Robin Nicoli. See you next week.